community and over the course of the next week or so we will present four programs on this critical global issue taking a local look at it and also an international look at the, the, the challenge of climate change and the challenge of personal responsibility to take care of the earth. I'm going to hand this over to our board member Yolanda Alcorta, who um, is the founder of Alcorta Connections and is also a person of great knowledge on this and many other issues. So it's a pleasure, Yolanda, to turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, it's, it's my pleasure to be here with everybody tonight. Bienvenidos. I hope that we uh, really uh, have a wonderful conversation. Um, about um, the philosophy of green, and to some of us, this is not a new idea. Uh, as I was commenting earlier with uh, some some friends uh, who are here in the audience, that uh, in the uh, 60s and 70s we were greening America, and it's interesting to if you go to the Kashland Science Museum, which is the science museum of the National Academies of Science, and they have a, a global warming exhibit that the focus of it is to convince you that there is global warming. And now they're actually thinking about changing that exhibit. Now that we, some people, or a lot of people believe in global warming, um, what can we, to, to focus exactly about what we're talking about today, which is what we as individuals and small community groups can do to have an impact on um, on our, our footprint, our, our green footprint. And, and I think that that's really what we are talking about today. And how the nation's capital can be a leader in this. Um, we're happy to have uh, Ron Hayes here with us, who is in, uh, to, to my left. And he's the co-founder of Green DMV. And DMV stands for District of Maryland and Virginia. And, uh, co-founded with Philip O'Neill, which we have sitting in our audience as well, so you can get to know him a little bit afterwards. And um, he is, they want to create green jobs. Green job. And a green job is any job that benefits the environment. And they're going into communities and uh, working with uh, some funding from uh, the D.C. government as well as the federal government to um, to create some of these green jobs uh, in our communities. And Cynthia Hartley, Hartley is the executive director of the Capitol Hill Energy Co-op, and this is not her first round on this kind of work. She's going to be telling us a little bit about how you can um, take your house and uh, make it more energy efficient various different ways, or if you're going to renovate a house, how you can maybe not go the cheap route, but in the long run, it will, it will cost you less to have your, to have your house. And uh, her organization that just had this wonderful tour, Solar Homes Tour Fair, and um, our council member, Tommy Wells, uh, from Ward 6, and uh, you know, as m many of you may know, that he was responsible for this, the plastic and paper, the five cent 
paper bag. Sort of, uh, you know, how the culture, the culture has changed in terms of, of now when you see bike lanes out there, you see people really uh, getting out. And we even have the, uh, the bike share program here in DC. And um, I'm not quite sure how long uh, that program has been implemented, but I've heard great things about it. People are really you know, picking up the bikes and um, you know, taking them to and fro to work. So I think um, you know, just looking at programs like that and how successful they've been um, is a clear example of, uh, of how the cultural, culture is actually changing uh, all around. In, uh, in the district now and see um, how folks are, uh, are bringing their, their, uh, their canvas bags in and, and foregoing uh, you know, using the plastic bags and whatnot. So I just think you know, those are two example of, examples of, of sort of how I see the culture changing in D.C. in terms of uh, sustainability and, and how people are, are changing uh, the way that the well, lifestyle choices that we make really is where a lot of the difference is made. And for example, just turning off the light in the room. When you think about the impact of turning off the light in the room or not, it's kind of just a personal choice. But it also goes all the way to the spectrum of whether you're going to own a car or not. If you own a car, you've made a personal lifestyle choice. And it has a substantial impact. And so how we influence those choices and how we're influencing those choices is really in three major ways. One is cost. That um, does it cost you anything to make that choice? The other is convenience. What's most convenient for you? And the third is what you care about. And so sometimes you'll do something that isn't convenient. You'll do something that, um, like in my office, we use ceramic mugs. It was a lot easier to use the little styrofoam cups, but then I realized this just didn't make sense. It didn't fit with what I thought was sustainable. And so, because we care about it, we use ceramic muck. Of course, it's called the Anacostia River Cleanup Initiative, but it's the bag tax. <laughs> and when I um, researched to figure out how do we decrease bags, disposable bags, from our environment, what I really looked at was what's the role of the bag? Is it something that we must have? And I met with businesses, asked about the role of the bag in their businesses, and what became clear and we all know this, is that for the most part, we were never asked, do you want a bag with that? I, what I wanted to do was to get somewhere in between that decision to force people to think, do I want a bag with that? And the idea was to get in, get in the head of folks, not to get into their pocket. And through a lot of research, we came up with a nickel. And I've got to tell you, the as for those of you that are involved in the the environmental you know, movement with rivers or whatever, one of the things that we've learned, it's had a dramatic impact in less than a year. Do local sustainable initiatives in the nation's capital serve as models that can inspire other cities across the country? Absolutely. That is actually my hope. That is what I want the Capitol Hill Energy Cooperative to do. I want us to be a model for not only other wards in D.C., but in the United States. We don't have all the answers, and we are looking to other communities to learn what they're doing so that we can replicate their efforts, build upon their model, and create a comprehensive approach that will make Washington, D.C. the most sustainable, green community in, in the United States. Residential, the Mount Pleasant Solar Co-op was the first one. And we looked at their model. We borrowed it, we stole it, we replicated it, however you want to look at it, but then we expanded upon it. And we went from solar programs to home weatherization, to urban backyard gardening. These are programs that were in the process of developing. Portland, Berkeley, uh, Philadelphia, Atlanta, Seattle. They have what's uh, called community uh, tool libraries or tool community tool banks, where people can go and borrow a tool at a minimal cost. Sometimes it's free. In Atlanta, it's free. So instead of everybody who has a backyard going out and buying a lawnmower or a hedge trimmer or a weed whacker, you just save that, save that the cost of materials, and you can borrow from your tool bank. Those are some of the initiatives that we would like to build here in DC. We would like to establish, and we would like for DC to be a model. And we absolutely think it's possible. We have some things to be excited about too. Um, the district is number two in green buildings. Um, I think uh, just behind uh, either Chicago or LA. So I think that's also um, something to be very proud of. 
Um, when we look at the passing of the Green Building Law, um, that was instrument, uh, instrumental legislation um, to pass. And I believe after 2012, all buildings in D.C. have to be sustainable, have to be green. Um, so again, I think uh, we're making great strides here in D.C. And if we just continue down this path, we'll be very successful in, in moving forward and being a leader in the nation. The cost of power is going to start driving our innovation, it'll drive our regulatory scheme, and also drive and our, our lifestyle of what we do. The other thing that's going to change, I think, dramatically, and already has, at least for me, is, is IT enhancements. Like, what's the relationship of, um, of smartphones and those sort of things and the choices that we make? We've already seen how people are, like, turning their power off or turning something off as they're going to the airport because they forgot. You've seen that on TV. It's an interesting commercial. But the other thing about it is, is that it's changed how I use public transit. By using next bus, I, I hardly took the bus ever. But by having next bus, I know when a bus is showing up within what period of time. And I'll take a bus instead of a taxi. And then as we even look at the, um, the bike share option, Again, there's apps on your phone that tell you where the bike is so that if you want to be able to get so far on the metro, so far on a bus, complete your trip if you want with the bike share, you'll know if there's a bike there. Urban agriculture is taking off in D.C. It's um, starting to have a substantial impact on quality of life, but also impact on creating <coughs> common spaces where people like to get together, get to know each other, it promotes a nice level of multiculturalism, and it also really has become, in some ways, a way to grow food in the city. Walker Jones Farm, it's a different approach to a community garden. They're farming a small piece of land, and the amount of just tonnage of food that's coming off there for DC Central Kitchen is mind-boggling. I didn't realize it could generate that much food. So when I'm riding my bike, which very, very sadly was stolen on Tuesday, so I'm quite upset about that, but when I rode my bike, what I loved was riding through the neighborhood and waving to people that I know. Neighbors that I used to live next door to, people from the dog park. If I were in my car, I would never see them. I'd be hopefully concentrating on the road. So when you're, the whole facet of public transportation, riding your bike, riding the bus, saying hello to your bus driver that you see on a regular basis, just putting yourself out there to integrate with your community, that sustainability. I want to talk about solutions. Um, and I want to bring it up too. Let's talk about unemployment. So right now in this country, we're at 10% unemployment. And in some parts of this city, um, Eastern River being one, we're between 30 and 40%. So imagine what a tragic that is when people don't have jobs. Now let's take sustainability and think about how can sustainability address this problem? And I'll tell you one thing I thought about that could work. So hopefully you guys will agree with me. Let's use weatherization. I think you touched on this a little bit. So weatherization, now let's think back. 1950, of course I wasn't born, but in 1950, I'm aware, <laughs> I, I am aware that in 1950, um, the cost of electricity wasn't what it is now. Insulation wasn't as important. So what that signals to me is that there's a need to weatherize homes. There's a need for additional insulation in homes. So what benefits can we get from this? Let's think about jobs for one. Someone needs to go in and weatherize all these homes that are not efficient right now. With 30% unemployment rate, think about the jobs that they could provide using the building stock of this whole city. Now, what is it gonna to take to do that? It's gonna take education. A lot of people are not even aware of this information. So it's people like you, people like me, people like the folks on this panel, that have to share this information. We have to, again, be more of a community, share information to get the word out. So, so again, if folks really did take that serious, Realize the benefits of sustainability to their pocketbooks and to the fellow folks who don't have jobs, it will make a real difference in D.C. And that's just one solution that I think could work if folks really get on board and stand behind it. Five-minute living is the idea, it's a lifestyle choice that you can't get in the suburbs. It's a lifestyle choice that you can get what you need, like fresh food, um, you can get to a pharmacy, you can get to entertainment. You can get to a lot of things within five minutes, and if you can't, you're on mass transit that can get you there quickly within five minutes. Five minute living is a lifestyle choice that a lot of people are making by moving back into D.C. We've had an increase in the number of population of people in D.C. and a decrease in car ownership. Part of what D.C. offers in five minute living, it offers a really great place to age in place. 
but also a great place if you're raising your family, because if you want to not be on, you know, 66 or I-95 <coughs> for long periods of time, if you can walk to work, get to work in a short period of time on mass transit, it's a higher quality of life with your family. And then, really, if you're just starting off in life, that you can afford more house, you can afford to have more disposable income if you're not car dependent. So as we create five minute living, we're finding that it's multicultural and it's multi-age in terms of demographics of who are embracing, who's embracing um, five minute living. So as we build out these communities, we want to have a built environment and we want to have the amenities that supports this lifestyle choice and as, again, as we, the private sector and the public sector invest another ten and a half billion dollars, that we do it in a smart way so that our city is sustainable in how we build, but also on what the built environment is like. Up to us to lead by example and show the rest of the United States and ultimately the rest of the world what one community can do, what we can do in D.C. How the power of people, the power of positive thought, the power of taking accountability for your actions and working together can have a return on investment many, many times. So what we're trying to do uh, with this initiative, initiative is we partner with businesses around the region um, and they're going to help us retrofit different people's homes to show and prove and demonstrate that sustainability is real, that it makes sense, people save money, it creates jobs and the whole nine. So that's another example of a local initiative that we think can have a greater impact and really influence other people to start doing things to push sustainability forward. I'll give you one example. We had a um, we had a green job training uh, class in uh, 2000 and not last year, and uh, one of the students from that class, uh, prior to uh, his admission into class, um, he did it. He was unemployed. Um, you know, had gotten in some trouble in the past. Young, younger person. Um, I think he was uh, uh, 21 at the time, and um, you know he was able to get into our class. We trained him to uh, weatherize homes and, um, and perform energy audits. Um, graduation uh, happened, I think, that September. And I think in a couple of months, he had a job with an energy company here in DC. So his life was totally changed, you know, turn, totally tur turned around by just receiving an opportunity to learn, learn about renewables, learn about green jobs, um, you know, about how to weatherize homes. Um, so that's just, you know, one example I have for you of someone that I know has benefited greatly from just getting more involved in sustainability as a way uh, to change this employment situation. I uh, have a question for Councilmember Wells. Um, I think that you are by far one of the more progressive members of the council. Um, so how, for those of us that don't live in Ward 6, you know, how do we encourage our leadership to take on these issues and begin to push these issues in communities that may be resistant, or it may be something they don't understand or it hasn't been explained, but how do we begin to make sure that this message is getting to other parts of the city? I think that's a great question. And I think that we do it in a couple of ways. One of the best ways to do it is through um, social networking and social media. And I know from sitting up here, but also she tipped me off earlier, that, that you are uh, tweeting this. <laughs> conference and I'm one of your followers. I think um, I think social media is a way to move an agenda and I think that it's it's moving much further along than people realize that I know that if my colleagues don't see it, their staff see it. And they bring it to the council members and say, hey look, someone doesn't like us out there. Well, I'm from uh, gardens and bicycles and uh, <laughs> social networking. Uh, caulking our, uh, our, our windows and uh, all those little cracks in the wall and actually building, but it really is about building community. Um, so I'd like to uh, you know, conclude the very first of this. I uh, again uh, invite you all to continue the conversations um, with us. Um, 
the rest of the week.